Well, this morning, as I've already said, we're going to finish, well, look at the next to the last of the Beatitudes. Um, this morning, blessed are the peacemakers. This evening, blessed are you when you are persecuted. Now, it, it, again, I just want to remind all of us that um, these things, like anything else that the Lord gives us in His Word, can easily drop out of our minds and out of our view so that they no longer influence us. Uh, we don't want to just be thinking about these things for these um, perhaps 30 minutes that we're going to be doing this this morning. But everything we hear, we, we need to try to hold on to it and, and incorporate it into our lives, make it a part of our lives. Now, these particular uh, virtues that Jesus is referring to here, remember, are things that are true of us if we belong to the Lord Jesus. These are not things that we need to do in order to receive the blessings. These are things that Jesus does in us. And when we see these virtues in ourselves, we know that the blessings belong to us. And yet, these are things that we still need to work on growing in, on putting on. This is a part of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, the Lord in, in uh, s several places in Scripture, actually, has given to us a summary of, of the moral law of God, which we call the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, we ought to know and we ought to, you know, memorize them and, and we should guide our lives by those commandments because that's why the Lord gave us grace so we would stop breaking the commandments and begin obeying Him. And I would just want to say that to suggest that maybe we should do something similar with the Beatitudes. You know, have these, memorize these virtues, have these, you know, before us all the time. And because I think it's a summary, again, of our Lord Jesus and what He was and the example He gave to us and what it is the Spirit of God is doing in us. So with that in mind, let me go ahead and read them. And uh, what I'd like to do is read verses 1 through 12 again, just to get them all into the queue. I want to briefly review what we've seen, hopefully from differing perspectives, and, and then uh, we'll get to the next one. Uh, so let me begin by reading them. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May the Lord bless His word to our hearing uh, this morning. And uh, let me just mention, as I, as I introduce this subject again this morning, you're going to hear the review of the other Beatitudes. And I would just encourage you again, don't tune out during that time. Sometimes we tune out during the review. But we need to have the review to remember what it is we've seen, just to get it again back up into our thinking, because it so easily slips away. So again, Jesus has been telling us here about the many changes that take place in our lives once His Spirit takes up residence in our hearts, once He unites Himself to our souls, He creates within us the same virtues, the same moral qualities that are present in Jesus' own perfect life. The Spirit of God is working within us to make us like Jesus, our example. Now, Jesus tells us that if we have these virtues, not in their perfection, but really in the slightest degree, they show that we belong to Him, that we are His. And if we are His, we are also the heirs of His kingdom and the blessings of the kingdom, which is what all these blessings are about. 
Now, let me just mention, we're particularly blessed, or at least we particularly know that we're blessed when we can see these virtues clearly in our lives. If they're fuzzy and ambiguous and so weak that we can't see them, they're not really going to do any good towards building within us an assurance. But if we can see them, then we can know that we belong to Jesus and we can know that all this that the Lord has promised is, is ours. We can know that we are His heirs. Now, He says we can know that if we are poor in spirit, if we are not full of ourselves, but full of Him, if we are humble like He is, if we find ourselves in, in various situations taking the lowest place to serve others rather than having people wait upon us, even as Jesus did. Remember at the Last Supper, He's the one who, who laid aside His garments, girded Himself with a towel, and, and stooped down and washed the disciples' feet. The Lord, basically God in human flesh, He was the one who was serving. And it's the disciples that should have been, but they didn't want to be. Well, Jesus was giving them that example. We need to take the lowest place. We need to humble ourselves. We need to serve Him because that is what He did. Now, Paul gives us his own example, something of his own testimony in this area as he writes to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, verses 34 and 35, and, and see if he isn't following the example of Jesus here. He says, you yourselves know that these hands ministered to my own needs and to the men who were with me. In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. It's more blessed to be the servant rather than to be the served. And let me just again remind you of what Sinclair Ferguson reminded us, which shouldn't surprise us, that the, the virtues or these, these, uh, uh, these qualities that Jesus is referring to are the exact opposite of what you find in the world. In the world, it's more blessed to be the one served and to have lots of people serving you. Jesus says, no, the... It's more blessed to give, to serve than to be served. Now, we can also know we are His if our sins so trouble us, if we're grieved and mourning over them, that it turns us from them to the Lord Jesus, first of all, to be saved. And then we continue to turn from our sins. We continue to repent. We need to repent, turn, and follow the Lord Jesus, but also... If the sins of those around us, and again, what we know they're going to have to endure, what they're going to have to face, so moves us that we are reaching out to them with the good news of the gospel. Now, again, we do need to move from desire to action. It's not enough to desire this. It's not enough to know this is what we need to do. It's not enough to even reach the point where in our hearts we want to do it. Blessed, we're blessed if we're doing it, you see. So these, this is where we need to grow. And this is one of the things that moves us to reach out to others. We are blessed if we have the same disposition that Jesus had, a kind and gentle and meek spirit that makes us welcoming. Not only to those who are outside of the Lord Jesus. Remember how Jesus makes the gospel call, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you for I am humble and lowly of heart. He's basically speaking about his, his meekness and his gentleness. People came to Jesus because they knew they would be welcomed. They wouldn't come to somebody you know, who was basically ready to hurl a lightning bolt at them if they don't. Jesus isn't like that. He's gentle, he's meek, he's encouraging but we should also be that way towards one another. We're blessed if we have this disposition. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle. We are blessed if our desire to be like Jesus and to do what he would have us to do is so strong that we're hungering for it. It's like a hunger for food or like thirsting for water to the point where it, it draws us out and to seek after these things, hungering and thirsting for what is right. Now, I think there's a difference between this and the purity of heart we're called to, because what it is we're desiring that things would be the way the Lord wants them to be, and that is our desire. We don't just look at it and say, ah, who cares? But that should be as the Lord desires it to be. You know, the Puritans were known as, as the, the pure people, the holy people. 
And they, their desire, their overall desire was that not only their lives and not only the people of God, but all of society would become holiness to the Lord. They were hungering and thirsting that the world be transformed into the way that the Lord would have it to be. I should also mention the Puritans were much more optimistic about that than we are today, but that's a different subject. Our, we're, we're blessed, now Jesus goes on to say, if our hearts are moved with compassion, if we show mercy to others like the Good Samaritan, if we forgive the wrongs that, that they've done to us, the Good Samaritan had to put aside his animosity toward the Jew and the fact that this Jew hated him, and to see there a man made in the image of God who was wounded and needed help, and he reached out to help them or to help that individual. We need to show mercy. We need sometimes not require that people pay us for things or return things, maybe even forgive debts. We need to be willing to help people that we see who are in need, even though it costs us time. It requires time, it requires effort, it requires money. We might even get injured more by the people we reach out to. But again, as we're going to see in the Sermon on the Mount, as Sinclair Ferguson moves on through this, that we are called to love our enemies, and love calls us to meet the needs of our enemies. We're blessed if we're earnestly fighting against our sins. If by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are getting rid of the things in our lives that we know our Lord hates, and seeking to put on those virtues that He loves, if we are seeking to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, we are blessed because these things show that we not only belong to Him, that we've been saved by His grace, but that we are His heirs. And again, just a reminder of what these blessings are. We will inherit the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We will have, or we have now, and we will have more fully in heaven the comfort of knowing that our sins are forgiven. We will inherit the new heavens and the new earth that the Lord is going to bring in when He is finished with this present world. And remember, that world is not going to be like this world. It's not going to be full of sin and hatred and warfare and disease and bloodshed, but it's going to be a world full of love and joy and peace because the Spirit of God is so going to fill us and permeate us, there will not be any possibility of any kind of sin. It will all be gone. Nothing to spoil the perfect happiness. Our desire to be like Jesus is one day going to be satisfied when we will become as He is. When we see Him either at death when He comes for us or when He comes again. We have received His mercy. We have the blessing of that mercy. He has forgiven us and clothed us with His righteousness and will receive us into heaven. And then the last one we looked at, I believe, we know we will be blessed with that beatific vision. We will see God as Jesus now in His humanity, seated at the right hand of the Father, sees this glory as the Father, or actually the Trinity, is revealing themselves in all their glory with such beauty and majesty that we will not be able to take our eyes off of Him for all eternity. Now again, that's the review. And hopefully those things, again, are, are back in the queue. But these are things we need to be aware of, things that, that we should find in ourselves, things that we need to be working towards putting on. And if that is true of us, we have those motivations, those encouragements that are set before us of forgiveness of sins, of comfort, of finally being able to overcome all of the sin of our hearts and being in a place where everything is going to be holiness to the Lord. Now, this morning, let's look at the next virtue that the Lord works in our hearts by His Holy Spirit that shows that we really do belong to Him and that we are the heirs of His kingdom. And that is in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, first of all, let's consider what it means to be a peacemaker because there are several different facets to this. First of all, it means to be somebody 
who loves peace, who sees the value of peace, who knows that peace is something that God values, something that He wants, who has a desire to see everyone living together in harmony. Remember we saw earlier, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Well, what is, what is right? Well, what is right is that, that neighbors would love one another as, as themselves, you see, that they'd be at peace with one another. And that's what those who love peace desire, is that men be reconciled rather than be at odds with one another. So first of all, it means to be somebody who loves peace. It means, secondly, to be somebody who seeks to live at peace, who doesn't stir up controversy where it doesn't need to be. I mean, sometimes it may need to be controversy when we're dealing with errors and so forth, but you don't stir it up when you don't need to stir it up. Who doesn't retaliate when wronged by others. Paul writes in Romans 12, verses 17 and 18, which was our meditation this morning, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. So the second virtue essentially is seek to live at peace with those around you. And by the way, let me just mention now, when you don't return evil for evil, we, we, let me just remind you what we've already looked at. This does not mean that the Lord is telling us that we need to throw justice out the window, that justice doesn't matter. But he is telling us that we are not to take justice into our own hands, but allow God to deal with the offender in this matter in his own way. And remember, the Bible says God will deal with the offender. He will either bring that person to the Lord Jesus Christ so that they might find salvation in his son in which case that offense that they've committed will have been paid for by the Lord Jesus. Or if he doesn't do that, he will exact justice from that individual in his time, in his way, perhaps in this life, but if not in this life, certainly in the life to come. Paul continues in Romans chapter 12 in verses 19 through 21, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. By the way, some people interpret this burning coal on the head thing as being kind of a blessing. You're filling his bucket with coals and he's taking the coals to his house to kindle a fire. But that's not what Paul is talking about. What he's saying is God is going to pour down fire on his head. He's going to bring vengeance against him. God is a God of vengeance. He is a just God. And what Paul is saying here is you don't exact it on that individual. Let God do it in, in his time. Instead, you should return good for evil. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. So return not evil for evil, but good for evil, and let God deal with the justice matter in personal offenses, okay? Now, it means third, being a peacemaker third, means to be somebody who seeks to maintain the peace and unity that God creates among his people by his Holy Spirit. Paul writes to the believers at Ephesus in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, those sound familiar, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So to be a peacemaker means, of course, not only to love peace and to try to live at peace with others, but, and, but it also means to maintain the peace that God creates. That peace comes about by the love that he gives to us for one another to be able to forgive and overlook sins and to meet needs and so forth. That creates a bond of love and unity and peace among God's people. 
Now, we know from the New Testament letters that wasn't always the result, was it? Because people were not yielding to the Spirit and they were getting in the flesh and they were doing things that brought disunity. We're being reminded here that it's something we need to yield to and work at, but we need to be those that maintain peace. Now, it means all these things, but it goes even further than this. It means to be somebody who works toward peace where there is no peace, who seeks to heal division and bring reconciliation. Now, it's, it's at this point I just want to remind us that that is really what God is. God is a peacemaker, isn't he? In other words, Jesus here is saying that this is a part of that image that God is working in us as he makes us like Jesus because Jesus is just like the Father. Jesus is a peacemaker. The Father is a peacemaker. Now, how is he a peacemaker? Well, because of what he's done for us through his Son. He has made peace between us, between man, between God and man through the blood of his cross. We do have to remember, and sometimes we lose sight of this, particularly if we've been Christians for a while, that we were God's enemies. I mean, we were at war with one another. It wasn't just a one-sided war. Even though God is, is merciful and kind and, and shows his, his love in, in, a, in a way of benevolence to all his creation, he's still pouring out his wrath against his enemies. We're still at war with him. Now, we were his enemies because we rebelled against him and Adam. And then that sin, of course, affecting our lives, we came into this world bent on doing the same thing, rebelling against God. And that's what we were doing every single day of our lives from the time we came into this world until the time that the Lord saved us. When we understand who God is and what he wants us to be and the thankfulness we should show and the life he calls us to live and, and the intentions of our heart that we should have, the love towards him, then we understand that I wasn't such a good guy, you know, when I was outside of Christ. I really was his enemy, even though I didn't understand it. But even though we were at war with God, even though the breach, you know, the offense was purely ours, on our side, God didn't do anything, we did it all. We're the ones who sinned. We're the ones who rebelled. God was the one who worked towards peace. He was the one who sent his son to reconcile us to himself, to bring peace between us. Now, Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11, which is a very rich verse. I think I've read it recently, but hopefully reading it a second time won't, it won't just escape our minds. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. And by the way, let me just mention, this is what the Reformation is all about. Okay? Having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And remember, reconciliation is when two parties are at odds, that their peace is brought between them, they are reconciled. Basically, God reconciled us to himself through the blood of his son. God is a peacemaker. The Father is a peacemaker who gave us a son to reconcile us, and Jesus is a peacemaker. He came into the world to be the means of that reconciliation. Now, that's why we sang that hymn this morning. You know, the, uh, what was it? Hark the herald angels sing because we were talking about this very thing. This purpose for sending the Son into the world was actually revealed by the angels, remember, to the shepherds as they were watching their flocks by night. And at first, when the angel appeared, they were terribly frightened but this is what the angel says to them in Luke 2, verses 10 through 14. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. 
you will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Jesus was sent into the world to bring reconciliation. He was sent to bring peace. He is the means of our peace. He is a peacemaker. And now that he has made peace through the blood of his cross, Jesus continues to maintain peace through his mediation. Now, one of the things we're going to see during the Reformation is that the church put itself in the place of Jesus as the only mediator between us and Jesus. But Jesus is the mediator, the only mediator between God and man, and we may be reconciled to God through Jesus, and we can, of course, come to God through Jesus. And he did that to the blood of his cross, but he does that by continuing to pray for us in heaven. Jesus is our peace with God. He is our peacemaker. And now, as those who have been reconciled to God through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus tells us that we are to reflect that same character, the character of the Father, the character of the Son, which is the same, that we will be peacemakers. And that's where we get to Matthew 5, verse 9. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. He doesn't say, blessed are you if you will be a peacemaker, if, you know, I command you to be peacemakers, but he's saying you are blessed if this is what you are. For they shall be called the sons of God. Now, peace, the desire for peace, and to bring that peace is, is a part of the image of Jesus, but as we saw emphasized in Colossians chapter 3, it is a part of that, of that one virtue, that one principle, that one thing the Spirit of God does within our souls that is, as Paul mentioned to the Colossians, that thing above all which we should put on. It is a fruit of love. That's what peace is and the desire to bring peace. The kind of love the Spirit of God brings into our hearts that makes us more like Jesus when he saves us. Again, Paul writes in Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now again, are, do you see anything here echoing from the Beatitudes? You know, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was anointed with the Spirit above measure. These virtues were in him in perfection. But Jesus gives us his Spirit so that these same virtues will be produced in our lives. Now, everything Jesus is, everything Jesus did, which is, again, a perfect reflection of the nature of his Father, can be summarized by love, so it shouldn't surprise us that the Spirit is working the same virtue in us as he makes us like Jesus. Now, when we see this love in our lives, again, it, it has many different facets to it, many different fruits that come from it. When we see that kind of love, Jesus says that we can know that we have received this particular blessing that we are the sons and daughters of God. Now, you know, there's a couple different senses in which the Bible speaks of us as being his sons and daughters. And I want to make sure that we're clear on which one he refers to here. There is that first one that's called adoption. Sons and daughters by adoption. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, when our sins are forgiven, when his perfect righteousness clothes us, when it's deposited, as it were, in our account, and we become perfect in the Lord Jesus Christ, then we are justified. By the way, that's what the Reformation is all about. Again, how is one just in the sight of God? How is one declared worthy to enter into, the, into heaven? It's only by the forgiveness that comes through Jesus. It's only by his perfect righteousness, which comes by, by faith. When we trust in Jesus, we are justified. And then when we are justified in the sight of God, and God looks at us as perfectly good because of Jesus and worthy to enter into heaven, only because of Jesus, at that moment he adopts us into his family and we become his children. Jesus, brothers and sisters, and the fellow heirs of the kingdom of heaven. 
That's one sense in which we are called the sons and daughters of God or the children of God. But I think Jesus has something a bit different in mind here. If we've trusted Jesus, we are the children of God by adoption, but we also become his children by nature. And we've got to be careful what we mean by that, too, because we're not talking about, and I don't want to sound too far out there, but we're not talking about becoming like God metaphysically or in being as though somehow we are transformed into some kind of divine being and become little gods. There are people out there that, that teach this. That if you belong to God, you are little gods. And as little gods, you can basically speak into existence things that, that don't exist. I mean, they, they want to attribute to each of us the power of God. And that's not what we're talking about here when we're the children of God by nature because that will never be true of us. We will never be like God in that way. But we will be like God in other ways when we begin to share not His metaphysical nature, his, his essence or his being, or become divine beings, but when we become partakers or sharers of God's moral nature. His spirit, when his spirit lives in our souls as an active principle of love, when he creates this love in us, he causes us to become like Jesus, as we've been seeing. And so we become the, the sons and daughters of God in another sense, because of the way we act because of the way we live, because of what our hearts are like, because we love Him. So that's what He's referring to here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. They are the ones who share His peace-loving and peacemaking nature. So when we find in our hearts a desire for peace, when we seek to live at peace with one another, when we strive to maintain the peace that the Lord creates among us by His Holy Spirit, when we work to reconcile those who are at odds with one another, and particularly when we become God's ambassadors by bringing the message of peace to the lost so that they can be reconciled to God, we show ourselves to be His children. We are His by nature. But again, you know, so that we don't, we're not too daunted by this and we don't just, you know, if we're honest with ourselves, we might say, well, hey, I don't find myself doing that very much. Maybe that's not, you know, I'm not like Jesus in this way, the way I should be. Let's not forget that like all the other virtues that we've read about here, this is something that we need to work at. This is something we need to put on. Our growth into the image of Jesus is not an automatic thing. It's not just take this pill and become like Jesus. Pray this prayer and become like Jesus. And you can just sit back and relax as you're transformed into his image. There's work that we have to do. There's the putting off of the old man. There's the putting on of the new man, which means the repenting of our sins and the doing what Jesus calls us to do. And that's true in every area, every area of our lives. But remember, we're not, you know, we're not justified. You know, I meant to, I meant to make that announcement beforehand. Do we... Anybody else has a cell phone with their volume up? <laughs> okay. But what we do, we're, even if we're not perfect, we're still going to enter into heaven. Okay? We're still going to, because we're perfect in Jesus now, when we've trusted in the Lord Jesus, we are already good enough. That's what justification by grace through faith alone is all about. So if we die at any point in the process, we're still going to go to heaven, but there's still the process as long as we're alive of becoming more and more like Jesus as we're waiting actually to enter into heaven at our death. So we have to work at putting this on. The Spirit of God gives us the desire and we need to yield to the Spirit of God, follow Him as He leads us and work at becoming more like the Lord Jesus. Now let me just mention in closing that the Lord's table can help us in this work, particularly the work of peacemaking, but it can help us in all of these areas of putting on the Lord Jesus because it reminds us, first of all, that Jesus was willing to lay down his life to be a peacemaker, to reconcile us to God. It reminds us the Father gave his Son, that he is the ultimate peacemaker, but that Jesus came down and made peace. It calls us, secondly, to thankfulness, to follow his example. You know, why should we be peacemakers? Well, first of all, because Jesus 
reconciled us to the Father. He did that for us. He saved us. So we should go and do it for someone else. That's what our Lord is calling us to do. Follow his example. But it can help us thirdly because it provides for us additional power. The strength and help of his Holy Spirit. Remember, getting more of the help of the Holy Spirit is also something we don't just sit down and it just sort of, you know, wait and just automatically bask in the, in, as it were, the, the sunlight of God and, and somehow you get filled with the Spirit. It's something we need to, there's things we need to do. And, and one of those things is coming to the table and remembering Jesus and looking to Jesus for what he has promised to give to us, that communion with Jesus at the table and receiving it by, by faith. I try to remind us of this each time we have the Lord's table that we do want to remember Jesus, do this in remembrance of me, but we also need to look to Jesus by faith because there's a communion, a sharing going on here, a participation in the body and blood of the Lord, which is not physical, but spiritual. Jesus is present to bless, and the blessing he gives us is more of the Spirit, more of the influence of the Spirit. It's not a quantity, but it's more of a, of a yielding. How much are you going to yield? If one is filled with the Spirit, it doesn't mean you're like an empty vessel and God opens up a cork on the top of your head and pours more of the Spirit into you until you're full. Sometimes that's how we think of it. But it means being emptied of self and being more under his control and influence. He's already there and he already is trying to move you to go a particular direction. You need to yield more to him and let him lead you that way. But also, as we use these different means, that influence gets stronger and stronger in us. And that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit, to be under His control rather than under our control. So as we prepare to come to the table, we need to be looking to Jesus. We need to be asking Him for more of that, of that influence of the Spirit so that we would desire more to serve Him. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, first of all, ask the Lord to apply what we've heard and also that we would not forget it, but remember that this is what the Lord has made us and this is what he calls us to be, our, our peacemakers. And then we'll spend a couple of moments getting ready to come to the table following that. Let's pray.